Hello and welcome to the Voice of Reason podcast. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's guest is Travis Brown, who's a filmmaker and Portland resident, and he's the head producer of Signal Productions, or The Signal Productions. He's got a couple of films coming out. One is called All Too Human, which is a autobiographical, semi-autobiographical sketch of an existential crisis, and another ongoing project, which he's raising funding for now, titled When in Doubt. And after this introduction, I will play you a trailer from that so you guys can get a sense of what he's working on. Basically, this conversation is about trying to figure out how disagreement can be overstepped by humanizing one another at this time of massive polarization and dehumanization. How do we get back on track with mature conversations? So that's kind of basically the outline of what we talk about. We also talk about art and the process and the practice of living a good life. So without further ado, here is a trailer and then a conversation with Travis Brown. A missed opportunity for dialogue is a missed opportunity for conflict resolution. And when two enemies are talking, they're not fighting, they're talking. It's when the conversation ceases that the ground becomes fertile for violence. So you want to keep the conversation going. Our friendships are compromised and our relationships are compromised. And it's impossible to have a genuine, authentic relationship. So I wrote the book to empower people to have difficult conversations, to speak across divides, and to feel that there is a way forward. What concerns me is that we're not solving problems. We have extremely serious problems, plastic in the oceans, environmental problems, social problems. And if we're not talking to people on the other side of a political aisle, then it's impossible to solve those problems. Where's demonizing anybody gotten us? You know, all we have to do is, is, is turn on our TV or look out in our streets. You are the enemy of the people. <laughs> we need to come together because we have a shared history. It's important that we know each other's history. And when you get to know somebody, it's very hard to hate them. So it's time that we get to know one another. Every time you have a conversation with someone, it's an opportunity for you to reflect on a belief you have and revise that belief and to stop believing things that are false or at least calibrate your confidence downward so you'll be more humble about what it is that you think that you know. If you think you have the truth, you don't seek it, you don't want it because why would you? You already have it. Many of the impediments that are in the way to belief revision are probably the result of our culture that makes it a stigma to question, to doubt, to change your mind. Uh, maybe one day that will change. Can I ask you about All Too Human? Because that sounds rather Nietzschean. It is indeed, yeah. I stole it from Human All Too Human. I was a big fan of, of his work, in particular that book and Antichrist and Beyond Good and Evil. Um, I really liked his writing style as well as you know a lot of the content yeah. and um so it's it's ba it's somewhat of a semi metaphorical autobiography uh, or excuse me a metaphorical somewhat metaphorical semi autobiography uh it's about a guy who has decided that his life's no longer worth living he's extremely depressed and he he tries to sort of cut himself off from his loved ones and kill himself but he fails and he just hurts himself and then he keeps trying and he keeps failing and that <clears throat> allows for various existential conversations around meaning and purpose and okay. all of the things that you know keep us keep us going in hard times it's so it's a very very dark comedy it's a black comedy uh more more dark than comedy <laughs> how did you work those uh, conversations in was that through uh monologue or uh voiceover um, no, it was through, uh, it was through, there, there are, most of the film takes place in one day, the day that he decides to kill him, try to kill himself, but there are flashbacks to, uh, his childhood. So there are some discussions that his parents have and, and that sort of thing. And then, and then there are people who like save him from jumping in front of a, a car, let's say, and then try to convince him that like, Hey, you know, your life really is worth living. And so it just sort of naturally leads to 
his reasons for wanting to kill himself and, and various hmm. perspectives, you know, you have Christian perspective, Buddhist perspective, you know, Nietzsche's perspective. Um, so yeah, that was kind of the way that I worked the, the conversations. As. That's an interesting, uh, Trinity there, Nietzsche, hmm. Buddha and Christ. Where do you yeah. <laughs> land on any given day? Uh, I, I'm, I'm more aligned with some of Nietzsche's philosophy, certainly not all of it. Um, I think some of it is rather uh, immoral. But I, 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 yeah, I'm not. I'm not a believer. I, I grew up as a as a in, in a fundamentalist Christian home, um, and very slowly left that behind. And and so, you know, as I as I alluded to, the film is largely about my life and the struggle I went through in losing my faith, and then having very severe depression and nearly killing myself and realizing that I needed some kind of structure and Hmm. some kind of meaning to, you know, to help me keep going. So it's the film all came, uh, uh, you know, from that. So is, is the structure, I'm going to assume because you're into Nietzsche that it's not systematic, uh, but maybe it is. This uh, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, Nietzsche is kind of an anti-systematist. He's an aphorist. He uh, he does have ideals, but even within his any given book, he's always posing an argument. He's saying things that he doesn't necessarily mean. Right? He's not building right. like a Kantian framework uh, or sure. Hegelian, sure. Uh, you know, overarching meta narrative. He's not about that. I see. Right. Uh, right. So I, I was wondering if, like, but you did bring up structure, so. How does that structure yeah. work out for meaning for you? Well, I think that um, with that lack of structure from Nietzsche, I, I found certain ideals from you know Buddhist philosophy, Taoist philosophy, Zen Buddhism to kind of in a way fill that space. But it's much more flexible, at least in, as far as I understand it, than hmm. like a rigid dog, dogmatic religion. Uh, yeah. So. You know, there are principles that sort of give my life structure, but um, there's an allowance for flexibility there. So it's, I'm, I'm not a postmodernist. I'm not a nihilist in any way. Um, but I, I tend to want to update my thinking if I encounter something new, which dogma doesn't allow us to do. So, Unless the dogma is particularly adept at adapting everything to it. Um, there's certain sorts of dogma. Right. Um, I think evolutionary theory is particularly keen as a theory of making meaning out of everything. Uh, Brett Weinstein's very adept at taking that formula, which I, I don't mean it derogatorily as a dogma, but it is a framework that he can apply to any given situation. And some of his critics sure. or some of the more interesting arguments that he's had pushed back on is that he takes that too far. Um, so there are certain dogmas or certain sorts of operating principles that uh, that do kind of uh, can replicate into any given phenomena, or at least have a very broad bandwidth of what they can incorporate into themselves. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that that sounds like a much more flexible system. Or do- I guess when I when I think of dogma, I think of something much more rigid and uh, inflexible. Um, but I do. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. So we're we're just wrapping, right? If if that's cool, can we just keep on wrapping? Yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me on. By the way. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Thanks for thanks for coming on at this uh, very frail moment in our democracy. Uh, depending on who you talk to. Um, right. So yeah. you brought up like spiritual practices such as Buddhism or um, various uh, uh, variations on that. What about there's there's practice. And there's also process. What about art? How does art fit into making meaning? And I asked that because I want to go from talking about your f- first feature film, Two Human, to your current project right now. Um, so I want to kind right. of chart, like, why art? Why film? And and is that a part of how you make meaning out of things? Yeah, no, that, that's, that's astute. That really is pretty directly my experience. So... Um, it has to be a type of art that, uh, for me at least, encourages people to think more critically about their lives. That is a, is a key part of it. But um, 
you know, I've, I've dabbled with different kinds of art, drawing and music and different things like that. But I really felt like filmmaking was where I wanted to end up and did ultimately end up. Um, because it, to me, seems like the best medium to really, you know, it hits all the senses, right? Mm-hmm. Pretty much, other than touch, yeah, and, it, and smell. it really can, right? Well, so you lick the <laughs> <It> dr- film. <laughs> right. certain theaters, it, though, that, that you really are immersed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I remember in I think it was was it Disneyland or somewhere where they like it was 3D, and then they had little things like that would touch you and stuff. Oh. But, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, uh, so you, you know it can involve all those things. But the the bottom line for me is that it like it really immerses you in that world and allows perspective taking um, in a much more accessible way than you mm. know writing a writing a book or reading a book, um, and which I dabbled with as well. But I, I ended up shifting to film, and to answer the question more concretely. Uh, you know, I make films like all too human and, and my newest film went in doubt because I want to engage people at the deepest level that I can to get them to think not only more critically about what they believe, but also, um, really want to connect with the, the human element. You know, I'm, I'm really interested in humanizing our opposition, uh, understanding, you know, that people we disagree with are not evil. They're not demons, you know, uh, as Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff say in, in uh, The Coddling of the American Mind, The Great Untruth, I think it's number two, maybe, uh, you know, life is a battle between good people and evil, evil people. It's very clearly not the case. And so through my films, I just, I like to, I like to go as deep as I can, but mm. in a way that's entertaining and interesting and that kind of sits with somebody for a while, uh, if that makes sense. I, I, I want to, expand on the word to humanize Mm. how do we do that and i think that that might be a very key element to all too human at least in in name and then this new new product could uh project could you tell the name of the new project it's slipping my mind right yeah the the new project is when in doubt and the subtitle is uh, you know the the uh oh shit i'm blanking on it but it's something to the effect of uh the, the importance of difficult conversations and the benefits of doubt. Right? Um, and so to humanize, I think, means to just recognize the human that is the humanness that is in people that we disagree with, uh, it, w- whether that's just a, a political opponent or the other side or mm-hmm. really anyone that we have a reflexive dislike or distaste towards. Um, you know, it's interesting. It's a little bit of a tangent, but it's something I've been thinking about lately. I've never really had any kind of visceral reaction to any political um, candidate. Uh, even tr- I'm not a fan of Trump, and I really dislike him, but I don't have a visceral response. But the the candidate who just lost uh, the the mayorship of of Portland, Sarah Ian Aroni. Okay, Ted very, Wheeler didn't. Ted Ted Wheeler didn't. Ted Wheeler won. Okay. He won. Yeah, but. But Sarah, um, man, I had just a really visceral response every time I looked at her, every time I heard her speak. (laughs) Um, And so I was noticing this in myself that, man, I'm I'm falling into this same kind of trap where, like, um, you know, she calls herself the Antifa candidate. There are all these things that I have major problems with her thinking. And I started to dehumanize her a little bit in my own mind, not on purpose, um, but just as a result of Hmm. our differences of belief. Um, hmm. so it's really easy to, to do, right. It's really easy to fall into that trap of, of forgetting the human element, forgetting that people have reasons for what they believe. Um, but, but they do. And we have to, I think we have to constantly remind ourselves of that. So there's some sort of chain of causation in a biographical sense, maybe this person had experiences uh, that lead them to believe what they believe kind of thing. Right. Yes. Yeah, Definitely. I think that's part of means to humanize somebody is to is to realize that their situation has produced them. In other words, you know their their genes, their 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 biography, their parents, their environment. These are things that are outside of their control as well as our control. And so I think recognizing that should allow for some compassion, even if what they're doing we find reprehensible. 
<laughs> like, uh, what was she doing? She was like pro Antifa. What was she going to do? Just Antifa. like when I get in, when I get in charge, we're burning the fucking federal building down. Like, what was she going to do? I, right. I mean, honestly, I don't know. I think there was a there was a big element of of the unknown and of fear, but. I mean, she she said things like, um, you know, I don't know that peaceful protests are moving us forward. She was at like dozens of the protests. She wanted to cut the police budget by $50 million. She made up this PhD that she didn't have. Uh, there were just a number huh. of things that I yeah. found really rather repulsive. Huh. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I, I can... So my major filmmaking, and I, I totally fell into being a filmmaker. I, I just wanted to write and be left alone, but um, that that's not what the great fate had for me. Sorry, I have to throw my cat around because I have a new setup here. Um, but I, I I did this documentary on Evergreen. I've I, I need to do about an hour more of it to wrap everything up. But I, you, you're aware of the Evergreen situation, Evergreen State yes. College. Brett yep. Weinstein, yep. Heather Hying. You're a fr- friend of Peter Bogosian, too, so you probably... Yeah, was... and Mike, Mike Dana as well. And Mike. Okay, you know Mike. Yeah. 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 And probably James and, 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 and uh, right. Helen, to a certain degree. I don't know degree. James and Helen as, as well, yeah. But... yeah. Uh, so there are certain characters in this, uh, in this story, and it's all on tape. It's all live filmed, right? It's live streamed. And mm. you, you have these characters that act acting absolutely repulsively. Um, and some of them are young or younger. Some of them are in their early 20s, mid 20s, and they're totally acting just like you don't act that way. So it's really easy for a stranger to the situation to have very negative reaction to that behavior. So it's kind of an interesting challenge. And in the official documentary, I tried to point out, don't look, don't judge the individuals, judge the behavior because the behavior comes from these ideas. The behavior comes yes. from the ideas. We need to concentrate on the ideas because we don't want the behavior to replicate. So you know, there, there are certain, but it, it's really difficult not to, there's certain very powerful, Powerful characters, and you want to diagnose them as narcissistic sociopaths. And there's this one character who is the uh, foil, in a sense, to Brett Weinstein. This uh, this woman named Naima Lowe, and uh, her body, her physical. She's not very physically attractive, um, which that's one level of it. But I I think anybody who's mature enough can just look past that. It's really easy to look past that. But her yeah. behavior, her ideology. And her constant victimhood, her ideas, it's very easy for people to hate her because uh, some, some of the footage that surfaced right after Evergreen um, hit the bandwidth of, of the American uh, attention um, was this speech she gave during the Pride, uh, some sort of Pride event in 2015, where she accused everybody in the audience of being a white supremacist, right? Or that, that there's white supremacists breathing in you now, and, you know, like this total power play, yeah. which is really easy to say, we hate that, we need to stamp that out. If every, if if all black people think that every disparity is based on white supremacy, we are totally screwed as a country. This is totally regressive mm-hmm. ideology. And, you know, plus the way that the internet works, people take hate and then they just reflect it right back at her. So she got a lot right. of hate. Uh, right. Sorry, sorry to ramble in my turn. I just want to no, kind of... No. When, no. when I first started the journey of trying to expose Evergreen... Uh, she was a big piece of it. Like I have to like try to get people to really understand her. And, and I showed some clips and I did make fun of her. I, I mocked up this, uh, Alice in Wonderland, uh, red queen. And I just changed, changed the skin color and gave her a rainbow, uh, licky thing. Um, you know, I made fun of her, but I, I really tried to concentrate on, on saying there are particular reasons why she believes this. And even if she's absolutely reprehensible in her action, her actions are going to damn her. So it's actually much more important for us to have sympathy for her and understand how she works because she has a huge influence on the students and how they acted. And if we can look past that, so I don't know if I was necessarily humanizing her just to humanize her, but I think that it, that was a, a very necessary step to get past that revulsion that people had toward her uh, behavior. Yeah, no, I, I think that's really important. And I'm, I'm glad you, you did that. I think it's, as I said, it's hard to do, but I think 
honestly, if we want to find solutions to whatever the problems are that we're facing, we have to do that. Because if we just have a knee-jerk or visceral, visceral reaction to somebody because we find them repulsive in some way, it's unlikely that we're going to have uh, the best solutions to solve whatever problem that they're creating, I think. Mm, yeah. uh, I think it clouds our judgment. I think, you know, if we, if we as you said, react in kind, just with more hate, um, again, that's sort of the natural thing to do typically. But, but again, you know, I mean, I, I would just refer to like Daryl Davis, who I got in the film. He's a mm-hmm. hero of mine. You know, as for anyone who doesn't know, he's he's a black musician and actor and and somebody that has befriended many many Ku Klux Klan members and gotten through dialogue, gotten over two hundred two hundred of them to leave the hateful ideology. And so I think that's a perfect example where he was able through conversation, through asking questions, to. Uh, find a way to get to the human element that was in, you know, within them. And, um, just, and as a result of doing that, they all, you know, many of them just left. Um, so, so again, he, you know, he, even though that's not a solution for the clan in general, he at least mm. was able to resolve a lot, um, just through talking and just through helping them realize the humanness in himself that he wasn't to be hated just because of the color of his skin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so that really captures what I'm trying to do with When in Doubt, which is to encourage encourage those conversations that we avoid with the people that we avoid in order to, one, strengthen our relationships, and two, find solutions that we would otherwise not find. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah. Do you, okay, this is really dicey. You can totally uh, deflect this question, but I'm just trying to run through s- scenarios of a Biden win and a Trump loss and the loss of Trump mm-hmm. as a leader. Um, that doesn't mean that we're going to be less polarized, but it could be an opportunity to be less polarized. And um, because, and this is just a projection, I'm just operating with a narrative that's not necessarily accurate at any given uh, individual level, but it seems to be the case that a lot of the left, um, let's take Portland, for example, if we had a Democrat leader over the summer, um, I guess you guys did, but if we had somebody in office that the Democrats weren't vilifying 24-7, if we didn't have Trump, do you think that the liberals, the moderate liberals, would have put up with that amount of rioting and that amount of unrest? I mean, it seems like they turned a blind right. eye to it because either they were scared of Trump or they were on board with uh, to some degree. Yeah, or, or scared to speak out against it. Um, yeah. I think there's an element of that as well. Yeah, I, I think there are multiple causes for the justification of and participation in the arson and looting and rioting and Certainly one of them is, is, is reactionary. It's reactionary to Trump, to thinking half the country are bigots, white supremacists because they voted for Trump, et cetera. That's part of it. Uh, that's obviously a very narrow understanding and not accurate at all. But um, mm. I think part of what, yeah, I think, I think fear is a big reason. You know, Douglas Murray talks about this a lot, the idea of standing up against the mob and the woman in, the, in D.C. at the restaurant who didn't raise her fist because a bunch of people were screaming at her to do so. Uh, I think she's great, and I think the more people yeah. should do that. But I, I think that's a that's one of the reasons. I mean, if you're going to be called a white supremacist for not bowing the knee or raising a fist or uh, not going along with this destruction of property, et cetera, that's you know that's that's scary. Um, and then the other reason is, I think people make a miscalculation. You know, I, I spoke with a friend that that is actually making the documentary with me. He's, he's a good friend of mine, but we disagree pretty wildly on on a lot Hmm. um but his point was you know if in the aggregate things move in the right direction uh, we have better racial justice uh etc as a result of burning burning down some buildings and having some small business owners lose their their livelihood well then you know overall it's sort of a utilitarian argument overall (laughs) it's it's fine and i thought wow man i i mean i can't make that kind of justification but you know um that's that's the other reason in terms of like wanting to give them the the, the benefit of the doubt um mm, or to steal okay. man the other the other side yeah is that you know, lives are not as important as property and, and clearly that's true but the miscalculation is 
these are people's lives that are being drastically affected. You know, the yeah. immigrant, immigrant small business owner whose building burnt down. Maybe they don't have insurance. Maybe they do. Even if they do, their life is pretty fucked. They might have three kids. You know, we, we don't know. I don't, yeah. I don't think it's for us to decide that that's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I just, I can't see, uh, I can't see a movement that disrespects property scaling into something that's ultimately just, if you can't respect <laughs> a citizen, right. like how are you really going? How is that going to like, when you build your brand new police station and you built it off the bricks that you've like thrown through the windows of all these shops. Like what is actually, where's going to be the respect, the civility and the dignity in that institution? I don't see it myself. Uh, that doesn't right. mean I hate the people who are acting that way. I kind of, I guess I degrade them mentally in my mind, calling them just misguided in, in some respect um, and try not to be yeah. too condescending about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's wild. I mean, some some people really do want to completely abolish the police, and you know, there's often pushback when you say that online. They say no one actually wants to get rid of the police, but there there are many people who really do, and they explicitly state it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think you know there is a small group on the fringe that really are Marxists and really do want to abolish capitalism. And that group really does want to change the whole idea of owning property. And and those ideas start seeping out and people start, mm. you know, glomming onto them, I think. Do you think that so. that um, moment, of, I'm, again, please deflect because this is impossible oh. to say, but how do you calculate that movement, Antifa, uh, hardcore Marxism um, going forward? And I guess we, we still don't know the results unless you do know the results it, of this election. So that's a big... <laughs> I, I don't. I, I am. I cannot. I'm not a prophet. Um, I, I, I hope and assume that Biden will win, but I'm really actually full of trepidation about that win. I very hmm. reluctantly voted for him. Um, but why? In terms. I mean, not why, why you voted, why but why, why? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think he's a he's a p very poor candidate. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that he's, if not senile, going to be very soon. Um, I don't. You know, I don't think. One, no one's excited. I don't know anyone who's excited about him. That that's unfortunate in terms of like having a unifying uh, message mm -hmm. or or you know getting people um, interested in the American project. I think that's tragic. I was interested in people like Yang, Andrew Yang, uh, and others, and I just I was, so I was hesitant for that reason. But the other bit of reluctance, you know, comes from from what people like James Lindsay have pointed out, which is you know, Trump banned critical race theory trainings, right? The, the diversity trainings for federal employees. And mm -hmm. Biden is very unlikely to do that. And obviously Kamala mm -hmm. is pushing for equity and, and things like that. So there, yeah. so there's baggage that comes with a Biden pre presidency, and I don't know what it will lead to. Um, yeah. So that's the, re that's the reluctance. Do you, how does that... Um, so when in doubt... Could you could you could you outline like what were you, what were you trying to do some of the structure what are you yeah. trying to do with it what is it about what it, well, yeah what are the themes sure. the way that you're getting those themes across yeah so we've we filmed some of it but we still have a, a lot more to go um, which hmm. is why we're, we're doing a crowdfunding campaign at the moment um, but our goal will be to find probably two or three pairs of subjects people who were struggling with a relationship who already know each other and maybe are avoiding a conversation, you know, one voted for Trump, one voted for Biden, one's an atheist, one's a Christian, whatever the differences okay. are, okay. it can be religious or political. As long as there's an ideological difference, what we want to do is um, set up a series of conversations for them and have Peter Bogosian coach them individually and together to improve that conversation and hopefully the relationship. So we'll, we'll okay. track, you know, two or three pairs of subjects and get to know them and get to know why they think the way they do. So ultimately, through that process, we're kind of we're humanizing both sides just through the film, and then and then they get a chance to express their views and hopefully learn some techniques um, that will improve conversations uh, yeah. with that person and with other people. And so the goal is to show uh, some, two two main goals of mine are to, sh to to give people concrete techniques to improve their conversations. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
so that they can strengthen their relationships and know how to, to talk to people they disagree with. And then the other one is to do a deeper dive on on why people think the way they do, why we have the moral intuitions that we do, ultimately to humanize each each side uh, of, of the argument. So J- Jonathan Haidt's book, The Righteous Mind, uh, was largely uh, in- inspirational, and I, and I initially wanted to base the film around that, but it was a little too complex to come up with like a concrete way to make that into a film. But yeah, I still hope yeah. to have him in the film to help us understand um, at, at a psychological level why these differences crop up in the first place. So you you guys said you're crowdfunding like a GoFundMe yes. or uh yeah, was, GoFundMe, uh, Starter yeah. I I forget that other one that Oh yeah there's Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Kickstarter. there's a few of them. Yeah. Is there like a tier that people if there you get enough funding we're going to have car chases and then people have counseling afterwards? <laughs> car chases? Oh, yeah, that'd be fun. Uh I mean, hey, if we get like a million bucks. Okay. Know, I'm just trying to put that out there because that might get people really interested. You know, like you're driving around in a Tesla, yeah. cops are chasing you, Peter Bogosian's right behind you, telling you how to talk to your best friend you haven't seen. Or how to talk to the police? Yeah. <laughs> or how to talk to the police? <laughs> that would be fun, but no, we didn't. I didn't factor that in. <laughs> how do you? Um, so that, that's a big project. How how do you see that? Or what was the inspiration for that? Why? Why do you think that's necessary? And I do have to plug, uh, since you brought it up, Peter Bogosian and James Lindsay, they wrote a book, How to Have Impossible Conversations. So it seems like you'll be drawing on that, right? Yeah, we'll be drawing heavily on that. Um, So initially, like I said, The Righteous Mind was really uh, motivational for me. But but before that, it was really the election of Trump. I I saw the election of Trump um, largely as a failure of the left to provide something that could connect with people and and just really ignoring the problems of identity politics and political correctness and then we had this guy come in that just broke all those norms and you know i think people were tired of being called racist or tired of being called sexist when they weren't and they saw this guy who didn't give a shit about any of those norms and thought Hmm. you know this guy is who we're going to elect and and personally, like I said, I really don't like Trump, and I especially didn't like him at the time. And so I was personally kind of blaming the left to some degree. It's not the only reason he got elected, clearly. But uh, so I had that in my mind. And then I just realized, or, you know, as, as we all saw, the, the polarization was getting more and more extreme. Social media was making it much worse. Um, mm. There were all these problems where people just didn't want to talk to each other anymore. And, I, and that's... That's clearly a problem for a functioning society. It's a problem for getting to truth. Um, so both Matt Limbo and I had the, the idea at the same time in early 2017. We thought, you know, we should figure out a way to document this and to offer solutions. And um, mm. so I shared with him the book, The Righteous Mind, and we, he, he really liked it. But then my, my, that's when my back went out really badly. And so I just kind of put everything on hold and... Um, Eventually, I, I realized that I wasn't really finding any solutions to, to my back pain, hmm. and I wanted to make this film somehow. Uh, and then I had become friends with Pete, and I filmed him for the New York Times um, for his book, How to Have Impossible Conversations, he and James's hmm. book. And, the, and I read it, and I gave it to Matt, and I was, you know, we both thought, like, this is a great foundation for our film. We can really offer practical tools to help people. And so I approached Pete with the idea. He loved it. And I said, hey, would you be in, into, like, coaching our subjects? He loved that idea, too. Um, and so mm-hmm. then it just kind of took off from there. It gave us a solid platform to to really structure the film around. So it doesn't seem that – I guess you do have Daryl Davis on, and he's rather an icon of, of somebody who reaches out uh, to those who hate them and uh, right. does some sort of amazing judo to get them to not <laughs> yeah. hate them. Uh, right, but it doesn't seem. Is there a framework where you're talking about uh, current events, current issues, or something? Or are you going to bypass these different uh, conversations that we're having and, and focus on the the individual relationship? Well, I, I'd like it to be more timeless than that. I, I yeah. you know, the the subjects that the, that the or the topics that the subjects discuss will certainly likely be topical, right? They'll you know likely be about current events. However, the the focus will really be on 
well, how do you improve that conversation? Well, you know, is the relationship more important than the conversation or is it, you know, more important than the disagreement, et cetera. So that hmm. is more timeless than just, you know, obsessing over the current uh, political crisis. Um, I mean, yeah. the goal, the goal is to affect that crisis in some way, you know, ho- hopefully, <laughs> but, uh, mm-hmm. so we did a, we did a proof of concept, which is about 10 minutes long where we took two subjects who didn't know each other and kind of put them together. One was a fairly far left kind of Marxist anarchist. And the other was a, a right of center, uh, libertarian. And we put them together and we had them discuss, uh, if systemic oppression exists, and if so, whether or not violence against the state is justified. So that's obviously a topical mm-hmm. issue, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I think played well. Uh, but they, they wildly disagreed, and and then we had Pete come in and coach them both, and then they had another conversation. Um, and that, that is out um, on Vimeo now. That I've released that also on our website, so people can check that out. And I think it, it turned out really well. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and I think it's... You know, Peter did a really good job at coaching them, and I think they both enjoyed the process. And so I'm hoping that our future subjects can watch that and mm. realize that we're not going to demonize anyone. And, and it's, it's uh, you know, it's an informative and even can be a fun process to, to go through that and to learn uh, those techniques. Because at first we had a really hard time finding a mm. pair of subjects who knew each other who wanted to be on camera. And we went through a bunch of people that were really promising and then eventually I said, man, there's no way that we can make this proof of concept unless we just pair two people together who already want to be in the film. Uh, so we just decided okay. to do that for the proof of concept. But for the film, it'll be people who actually know each other. That's the goal. Is the goal to agree to disagree or to dissolve disagreement or to examine why disagreement is scaling up into this impossible uh, relationship problems? Like... I think more the latter. I, I mean, I, you know, I think my hope is to coming back to the humanization part is to help each side understand why the other side thinks the way they do, and you know, per- perhaps through that come to some kind of agreement or compromise. I, I, I don't. I'm not setting anything in stone in terms of like what okay. I want the outcome to be, other than hopefully an improvement of understanding of one another, as well as okay. an interesting exchange. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. The way that um, I've been toying with this idea, I'm going to, I'm trying, I I won't, I promise not to ramble, but I've been toying with the idea about disagreement and how uh, certain forms of uh, media, social media specifically, have evolved into these echo chambers, right? There's these echo chambers, these people who agree Echo chamber is some some place where everybody agrees and then reinforce reinforces what they already believe, right. uh, and then you have these skirmishes, or you completely avoid uh, those who you disagree with. And there's different unfortunate rhetorical tricks uh, that on the level of social media where we're all strangers and we're making very tenuous friendships um, that we eventually become familiar with people, but we have to agree before we can become familiar with people. Um, We have to be exposed to them long enough. And so we have to stomach them long enough, especially in the, I'm thinking of Twitter and the way that relationships form on Twitter. And part of my work has been my side gig within my channel is to float around on Twitter and find an interesting voice and then launch out of Twitter into this format, which isn't real, but is much more in depth uh, than yeah. Twitter. Uh, so it, it's interesting. Um, one of the questions that I guess I have and maybe you can help me with this is how do we, how do we pivot out of the moment where so much uh, currency is afforded to merely what we agree or disagree with, what we believe or don't believe in. That, that, for, for that to be the defining mode of us making connections will not sustain us. I think that will fracture us. Right. We're, we're witnessing the, the outcome of that. So how do totally. we deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's a multifaceted problem and it, re- it requires a multifaceted solution. And I think mm-hmm. what I'm at least t- attempting to do is is hopefully one part of that, which is, to get people off of those platforms and having real conversations in real time. I mean, even if it's virtual, that's still better than, you know, 140 characters or whatever. That's just text. I think we, I mean, the, the very obvious, we, we 
we can't tell what someone's facial expression is what, when they're writing a text. We can't hear their intonation, et cetera. Mm. Uh, but, but The Social Dilemma, that film really laid out the, that aspect of the problem uh, and how poorly the incentives are, on, are aligned. So really a, like a broad spectrum view is the incentives for companies need to be aligned a little differently, I think. Mm. And uh, mm -hmm. the platforms really ought to change to, to foster better dialogue, uh, to not allow us to be in those bubbles, uh, because that that's just sort of organically created, depending on what we like or what we search for. And that that I think fundamentally needs to change. But mm. I'm you know, I'm not uh, going to be a part of <laughs> changing that. So what I can do is, you know, get people in a room together to talk about the things that that they don't talk about on Twitter or in a way, at least, that they don't, and uh, yeah. to really hear the other side from an actual human being rather than uh, what even could be a bot, you know. So, yeah. So yeah, I think there are, there are many things that, that need to change for us to get out of our echo chambers and really, like, engage with each other. Um, and, you know, I'm just trying to provide, to some extent, one hopeful solution. I do, I do want Tristan Harris to be in my film, I've wanted that Who's for a long that? time, but uh, he was in the social dilemma. He's one of the main guys. He's a um, technological what is the social ethicist. Dilemma? Oh, the I, social dilemma. I oh, it's great. That. It's on Netflix. Um, it's all about just the way that social media companies um, have been fracturing our society and the way that incentives have been aligned to create more and more extreme views and, and tighter and tighter bubbles. Uh, and it's, you know, it, People that are in it are mm. people like the CEOs of, of YouTube or, or previous, you know, high le high ranking people and all these various companies. It's really fascinating uh, and and a little troubling, <laughs> but it mm. it really kind of uh, shines a light on the underlying mechanisms that are creating a lot of our polarization. So, yeah, and, and Tristan Harris is 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 one of those guys. He's he's been kind of sounding the alarm for a long time about this stuff and trying to create methods to um to quell some of that i mean he i remember a long time ago he had ideas like if you live in the same town and you're having an argument with somebody on facebook facebook could create like a let's have a dinner button or you know something like that mm -hmm. i mean he came up with all these these suggestions on you know don't have your phone uh, next to you when you go to sleep use an actual alarm clock just ways for for people to be less mm -hmm. obsessively con sort of controlled by their uh, or you know uh, obsessively into their devices mm -hmm. uh, so yeah he's great how does filmmaking uh as an art form uh employ you in a different space or a different way of thinking than let's say social media maybe you're the wrong person to ask because mm -hmm. from what you said earlier you're not really on social media so you're not hyper online it seems Maybe I'm online, aren't. but I don't have big okay. platforms, and I yeah yeah. So I, I'm not sure I understand the question. The, um, I just I'm just wondering the practice of filmmaking. What do you? I guess with this film, how do you construct something like this? You, you're looking for the right people. Um, yeah. I, I'm wondering if we can pivot into craft, but maybe we can't. That's kind of a difficult thing. But maybe you have some juicy tidbit behind the scenes. <laughs> like how are you sculpting this thing? I guess to start, you know, I, I didn't go to film school, but I just started, I bought a camera and started pl playing around with my friends. And then I started going to networking events, which is really where I started to find crew members and actors to be in my, my short films. And through that process and through the process of just working on other people's features, you know, independent features, I, I got mm -hmm. to know certain people in different positions, whether it's gaffer, makeup artist, whatever. Um, that I really liked working with. And so I typically just bring those people with me. And and usually I'm lucky enough to have um, inspiring ideas, I guess. So people uh, hmm. are willing to kind of like go out on a limb and do something for very little money because they like the project. Uh, okay. and, and so it's hard. It's hard to be an independent filmmaker, but part of it is is having an idea that people are interested in. And, you know, for the... For everything we've filmed so far, uh, I haven't been able to pay my crew nearly as much as they deserve or that I'd like. And so hopefully with our campaign, we can raise enough to, to pay them decent wages. But um, so that's one aspect of it, I suppose. And then in terms of actually finding people to be in the film, 
I mean, Pete has been instrumental in that in terms of, um, you know, connecting with me with certain people to be the talking heads. And, uh, and then we just put out a call for submissions. Uh, I had like a Google form where people could hmm. sign up to be in the film. And we had something like close to 70 people reply. And then you kind of weed through those. Then Matt and I meet them like this virtually. And then we um, just kind of whittle it down and, and uh, choose our subjects that way. So through Craigslist, Facebook, Twitter, all those, hmm. you know, all those arenas. I, uh, I was listening to an interview that you did uh, earlier today. I can't remember the guy's name. I need to have a step oh, Will, secretary. Will Roosh? Yeah. 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 It sounds He's right. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And it turns out you were at, was he at the Demore event? But you were at the Demore event. This is I in... filmed it. Yeah. That's all Wait, my footage. Actually. You, you, oh, the stuff that ends up in Mike's, uh, wait, where does that? So, well, he, he seen, was there too. Yeah. 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 He, we shared footage. So he, he shot part of it. And then I had like three cameras as well. Uh, and so like the one clip that went viral that has the girl like yanking the speaker cords out, that was a combination of like my footage, his footage, <laughs> maybe Tim pool, even like just yeah, various there too. Andy. No. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but I was hired by Andy to film that event. Oh, okay. Back in, yeah, whatever that was, twenty sixteen. Yeah, yeah, I was there too with my friends. Uh, oh, okay. Just, like, so nice. it's really interesting. Yeah, there was a lot of people there uh, at that yeah. particular moment. I don't think uh, James was there, but I know Peter was there and Helen was there too. I, I was able to sh- at least shake her hand. Um, nice. Have James you been... was there. He was in the audience. Oh, he was there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I missed my chance to meet him in person, but I guess we have an online friendship of sorts. So nice. I guess that, that's yeah. just going to have to be, uh, keep it there for the time being. Yeah. Have you interacted with that kind of stuff? Where did that take you? So for, for the audience, uh, James Demore is a Google employee. He wrote this memo because he was asked to write this memo <laughs> about uh, the worth of um, these different diversity hires or different push for more women in STEM. And he kind of just factually laid it out, got in a lot of hot water, got fired, had a eight month kind of uh, whirlwind tour, very shy guy. Uh, I have a uh, interview with him on my channel, but there was an event in Portland with him and Heather Hying and Peter Bogosian and Helen Pluckrose. There might have been one more person there. Uh, it was protested uh, because they were really, the protesters thought it was just this white supremacist macho thing that had a bunch of women on stage that were like very professional women. And then there was a little dust up there. It was kind of a fun night. Um, but yeah. were you involved with Andy No and kind of uh, tracing? That That was kind of his start too. Um, and, and yeah, yeah. So that started for that. me back in like I think early 2017. Um, Pete had connected me with somebody who helped fund a little, give me a little bit of funding for All Too Human. And then hmm. as a result, I, you know, he told me that there was this event coming up, a separate event with Dave Rubin and Christina Hoff Summers, and and I said, oh, okay, I'll film it for you for free because you know you gave me this connection. And so that's how I met Andy, and then. Ever since I filmed that, Andy would hire me to film other PSU events. Um, you know, did one with Sarah Hader and quite a few others, hmm. and um, and that's how we kind of connected. And um, the, the Demore event was the last one that I filmed. And my back was okay. really not good after okay. that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's how we we got to kind of know each other a little bit, and that's how Andy became. Famous, infamous. <laughs> That's how he became known. Yeah. That Andy yeah. now. Um, so when does All Too Human come out? Uh, I think it's going to be mid to late January. I, okay. my, my distributor still hasn't told me where, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure it'll be on Amazon, iTunes, etc. It should okay. be on okay. a number, yeah. number of platforms. So, yeah. yeah. We're in this world where things are just released digitally. Yeah. Rather than, are you going to have like some sort of party with cocktail stuff? And I mean, I, I did back Nietzsche in quotes. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I did back in 2017. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be a good idea. <laughs> uh, we did, we did a private premiere in Lake Oswego okay. near, near Portland. Um, oh, I, so I it's been produced and kind of shelved for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, uh, my whole life kind of got put on hold for like two okay. years because of this back yeah. problem. Yeah. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. 
it, it was finished in 2017. So it's been a while. <laughs> At the very beginning of our conversation, you said something I wanted to ask. You used the past tense with uh, liking Nietzsche or, or Nietzsche. You said that you, it, it seemed like you were over him. That's kind of a process a lot oh. of people do go through. They, they go through a Nietzsche phase. Not a lot of people, but the people who do. Then they get over him, yeah. maybe come back later. Are you? Where are you at and why? What was your path through Nietzschean discourse or his thought process? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I came across it when I was sort of really questioning and, and starting to leave behind my Christian faith. And it just kind of, it, it, it felt very nice to find somebody who had, articulated a lot of the thoughts I had. Um, and so that was kind of the start. And then I read most of his books and was really inspired by some of it. Um, you know, as I said, there's there's some things that I disagreed with, obviously, but, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say that I dislike his philosophy now. I think I just, I moved to more contemporary thinkers, you know, like Steven Pinker, you know, these, these, ty- these people that focus on our current sort of current problems and are, are less, perhaps less heady um, and more practical. I think, I think mm-hmm. the problem I had with, with some philosophy is that it, that it exists in philosophy departments and in philosophical discussions, but it doesn't affect the real world. And I really don't like that kind of philosophy. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it can be fun to play with, but um, for it to really be useful, I think it has to be impactful and useful in your life. Um, so I guess maybe that's my reason for um, not not reading it much anymore. It's been it's been well I don't know probably five six years before I, or since I've read a a book by him. But I still have all his books. I'm sure I'll make my way back through them at, at, you know at another time. So is there a lingering thought from his that pops up? I mean, uh, maybe it's just buried in your operating system at this point. But is there <laughs> something that you? Yeah, I mean, for all too human, especially, I was inspired by his rethinking of of, of value structures. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he he was going to write a four part series called "The Revaluation of All Values" before he mm-hmm. lost his mind, and um, and the first one was Antichrist, which I really loved. It's a very short book, but I I really gravitated toward that idea and kind of incorporated that in All Too Human. There's three parts in All Too Human. And the last part is titled The Revaluation of All Values, the idea of letting go what you've been taught, what you've been told, the typical value structures that you grew up with, and and thinking about it as much as a human being can uh, for oneself. And mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and so I, I, that stuff still sticks with me, and it's one of the reasons I'm I'm not a big fan of some of like Jordan Peterson's work, um, because I think it's it's contrary to that. I I uh, I like in that. Way. Well, uh, in the way that <clears throat> he he t- tends to say that we sort of all need religion and we all believe in God in, in one way or another, and I don't I don't buy it. Um, hmm. I think mm-hmm. I think I think some people uh, religion is very useful for, but I, I don't think that it's it's a requirement to live a meaningful mm-hmm. or or fulfilled life. And I think I took some of that from. Nietzsche's work. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's very complicated. Uh, and I know that may sound a little glib, but, um, no. and I'm sure maybe like Brett Weinstein would, would disagree with me there. I'm, <laughs> but you know, I, no, I he's, uh, he's pretty atheist. I, I just, my, yeah. my question right now, I, I understand there are people who can move through the world without that value structure there, but I, I don't know if groups or societies can function without cool. that. So that's the question. And Portland is well. Evergreen was the small <laughs> test. Portland's the next right. upgrade. It's like, what do you have when a when you have a bunch of believers <laughs> with no really right. positive value structure roaming the streets, other than white silence totally. is violence? You know, these completely decimatory deconstructionist right. values. No, I I do actually agree with that. I, I I think on an individual level, people's beliefs can vary, but I. And I and I, you know, Douglas Murray has talked about this, and I interviewed him about it a little bit too. But um, something that that unifies us, and that is like, we do need to have goal-oriented value structures, and mm-hmm. they should be positive. I think my qualm is just the, the the supernatural claims and the otherwise negative 
um, dogmas that come with certain religions. Um, that's that's what I have a problem with. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you know, Christopher Hitchens talked about this a lot, which is the idea of um, kind of excavating the positive aspects of religion and making them secular. And I don't know how you do that. I don't know. If, you know, I don't. I'm not going to claim to have any idea on really how to do that, but mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. that. I think that's really useful or, you know, as, yeah. as, as happened, Christianity and, and Islam has become more and more modernized and they leave behind uh, some of the more negative uh, beliefs. Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. that that's another way that that happens. Um, so I'm, I, I'm not exclusionary. You know, I want everyone to be able to believe what they believe. And yeah. I, uh, I, you know, we, we should retain that. Right. But I, I think that, um, <clears throat> one point of my one viewpoint that I hold to is just like it at Evergreen, what's happening in the streets of Portland is this, you know, concrescence of youth, uh, mostly youth. Uh, there's every once in a while a middle aged person with a gun going around uh, assassinating people. But aside from that, um, there it's mostly it's mostly just uh, people trying to grow out of these progressive values. It's a revaluation of the values yeah. that they're taught, and and so the question is not just to create a new religion or to excavate the positives from old religion and somehow pass them on. And you need stories for that. That's where I kind of sure. agree with Jordan Peterson, maybe not literally, but metaphorically in his use of metaphor. Um, You need these devices that really connect to us and story is the most powerful thing that we have uh, that to transmit that kind of full embodied um, understanding. Movies are basically an extension of story. And maybe you can disagree with, you could totally disagree with me about that, but I think that they are just attacking things. I agree actually onto story. Um, so, but, but not only do we need to design or figure out how to design some sort of modern, uh, set of stories and values to pass on, but we have to design within that enough wiggle room for the young people to grow out of and to reevaluate their values. Like Nietzsche was very important to me in my path out of Christianity. But once I got Mm. through that going out of, like I needed something positive. So I needed to go back and very slowly kind of figure out um, what, what I was missing when I left that behind and what I needed to leave behind that I wasn't missing anymore. Right. So that, that process of breaking free is really made explicit by the protests. It's made explicit by these violent acts. They're, they're meaningless in and of themselves because they destroy meaning, but they are meaningful in the charting this generation and hoping them, uh, hoping that they get to the other side uh, without having to be, you know, jailed or imprisoned or anything too negative happening to them. I mean, there are, there's at least one evergreen, evergreen student that's in my documentary that's been showing up in these riots and getting arrested. So Mm -hmm. it's interesting to chart that and trying to figure out how do we give something to the young people that they can resist, but then they can land on their feet when they're done destroying everything in their myopic rage. (laughs) Right. What, did you come back to Christianity or what, what was the, you you said you sort of got, had charted out of that, but then you came back to something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. I I found uh, I found uh, spiritual practice that is, was divorced from all religion that had that mm-hmm. core connection to the spiritual reality. Um, mm-hmm. That that the power of sorry to use this term I don't mean to turn anybody no, off it's... but the power of God or the, the Holy Spirit that was what I wanted I didn't want any of the trappings to that once I attained sure. that. Uh, then I could start putting my life in order. And now I'm fond of religions, um, fond of mystical traditions. Um, I have a very deep, whenever I go to a very old in Europe Catholic church, like I have a very deep instant connection with with that. Uh, but I'm not really practicing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, I think, yeah, the older I get, the more I appreciate the unifying aspects of religion and the community that it provides and not not just the community, but the but that higher level connection to something that's bigger than ourselves, and and that's it's really positive and useful. And so, yeah, we have a variety of competing meta narratives or religions, yeah. and and this meta narrative is now driving much of these protests and the violence is 
thing that you know James and Helen have outlined in the cynical theories. It came from postmodernism. It is a kind of woke religion, uh, and I'm doing a, a separate documentary series on that called the Woke oh. Reformation. That, that that should be out in February, I think. Wow. So uh, that's another thing I'm doing. I'm I'm trying to kill myself by doing two documentaries at the same time. But uh, <laughs> could you outline that the Woke Reformation? That sounds fascinating. Yeah, the Woke Reformation. So yeah, I was really inspired by cynical theories. James and James Lindsay and Helen Pluck wrote this most recent book. Excellent and book. Douglas Excellent Murray, book. The Madness of Crowds. Yeah, that, that's good. Really, too. really good. Um, and I got connected through Peter to a few people who wanted to be in it. You know, so I have Douglas Murray in it. I got. Nancy Rommelman, who's been reporting on the, the protests and stuff here, uh, okay. she was great. But the, the basic idea is that there is something uh, like a new religion that is based on woke social justice activism, not actual social justice, but the sort of woke version that has come from the universities and ultimately from postmodernism. So the series hopefully will clearly outline, for every, everyday people, will outline the roots of this stuff. Um, I'm speaking with Helen tomorrow about doing some narration, which will be really fun. Excellent. Um, and so it'll outline the roots, uh, explain how it sort of morphed into what it has morphed into and how it got everywhere, you know, uh, especially in the wake of George Floyd. Uh, and then mm. it will be kind of a call to action, like what can everyday people do to push back against this stuff? And I really want to highlight the importance of, for instance, if you're against sexism if you're against racism if you're against homophobia don't go along with this woke nonsense because it doesn't actually achieve the goals that it claims and it's mm. divisive it's harmful um this isn't this isn't the, the path forward so it's a bit of that yeah it's tricky to explain to people why anti-racism is not a good idea not tell the, me about the, it that's my life story. The, <laughs> yeah there you go you, you know exactly what i mean but it's hard yeah so Wow, that's the goal with and that, you said that that's going to be a series. It's going to be like a like twenty minute. Uh... Short, no shorter. It'll be really like bite size, probably like five to ten okay. minute pieces. Um, and again, I'm hoping to nice. make it as digestible and and uh, you know uh, easily accessible as possible, so that everyday people can really grasp what the hell is going on. And car chases. How many are you planning? On? <laughs> oh man. I'll do I'll do some animated card chases. Just just at least one. I just want one, but I'm yeah. not gonna tell you what to do. I'm just like I want the the fast and like the furious, but like the reasonable version of that. You know, I don't know but where they go really slow. <laughs> well, <laughs> fast all around, but like on inside on the inside of their car, it's very reasonable. Hmm. Mm, yes, lots of padding. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. So. um We'll direct people to your "When in Doubt" fundraiser, um, and Great. I will. Uh, I guess a viewer will have already seen the clip that I put in at the beginning of this interview. Um, oh, but great. I also link to the ten-minute kind of proof of concept for it. Um, Excellent. And are you guys going to be releasing that on YouTube, where people can readily find it, or is it on Vimeo? Uh, in terms of like Vendor? the trailer and proof of concept, or the the old the feature film that we where create. can people find your work? Where where is your work oh, like sure, located? Yeah. yeah, I mean the, the best way to find updates on the woke stuff and on when in doubt would be to follow me on Twitter at become the signal, one word. <laughs> yeah. uh, I just have to say <laughs> that there's so much disdain hidden in in the <laughs> reference to Twitter. <laughs> Follow me on yeah. Twitter. <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah, yeah, I'm not a fan, uh, and I don't really have very many followers, but that's okay. Barry Weiss followed me randomly the other day, which was Aww, pretty great. That's sweet. <laughs> yeah. Maybe she, but, uh, she she should get her up to the list. Yeah, yeah, she she would be great. Uh, but yeah, when in when in doubt, film dot com is really where you can find everything, all the videos, all all the information, uh, and we even have a discussion forum going where we're hoping oh. people can kind of participate and. And Great. talk about their own difficult conversations. So yeah, yeah when in doubt film dot com will have everything there and then my Twitter handle will have all the other stuff. And the woke reformation, you expect that out in uh, February? Is there going to be any uh, viral marketing where you're just going to go tack some principles up onto a door or something like that? <laughs> yeah, definitely do that. I, on the, I have to find the woke church first. I guess it's the university. <laughs> it's everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's everywhere. Uh, yeah, I don't know where that's going to be released yet, but um, I'm sure we'll have some plan when the time comes. Uh, but I, I will put the inf info on Twitter. That'll be 
the best place to find that stuff. So excellent. Yeah. Excellent. I'll, I'll end the recording. You want to say goodbye to everybody or do you want to see the cat again? Should I show the cat? Oh, sure. I should show you my dog too. Oh, you have a dog. Great. There was some noise yeah. I heard. Yeah. Nora, come here. What's your cat's name? Uh, uh, Bodie. Do you want a treat? Do you want a treat? I'm lying to my dog. So Bodie. Oh. Can we do a cat and dog in the same frame? Go. There we go. Let's see. You got to flip upside down, dog. Oh, there we go. Oh, wow. <laughs> They're almost the same color. Yeah. That's how they get along. She's very sweet. There we go. It's rare that we get How many cats do you have? Dogs. Just two. How many dogs do you have? Are Just you a crazy one. dog man? Uh, I am now, apparently. Yeah. I, I could have another one, but she, I, she's, she's enough. Congratulations for reaching the end of the podcast. If you enjoyed this product, consider donating to this channel via paypal.me slash Benjamin Boyce or joining me on Patreon. Also follow me on Twitter at Benjamin A. Boyce. Have a good night.